Uh, Nazreen, you're watching GTV live uh, on Facebook and GTV.media. My next guest, a very dear friend of mine, uh, parliament, young parliamentarian, member of Scottish Parliament, and a server. Thank you very much Salam, for coming. To My How are you? I'm good, Bayan. I'm going to come. love to you and your family and everyone watching. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very inshallah. much. I just read it today your post. I knew uh, your brother had told me, but your grandmother is obviously 93 and she's not well. It's, it's <laughs> Mashallah, my grandmother is uh, is well, uh, but just as the advice is that anyone that's over 70 and has any preconditions should be uh, deliberately isolated for their own safety so we've had to make that decision with with our grandmother and the, the, the reason I want to highlight that Goshibai and the reason why I put that on Facebook yesterday is we've got to lead by example so if we're telling people to if we're giving people advice and we're asking people to isolate their uh, their older population to isolate if they're not f uh, feeling too good or they have preconditions then we've got to lead by example uh, and so it's difficult for us all um, it was very emotional having to wave at my grandmother. From it's very hard. It's very hard. Very hard, but we have to do it for their own safety and for their own well-being. I was reading in the Independent that it's very vulnerable for Asian families, especially Pakistani families, three generations living in a house. And I didn't think of this before. Me, my yeah. mother and my kids, we all stay in one house. Yeah. So three generations are staying in one house and we've got more chances of yeah. catching... Because if you, if, you, if you think about it, Goshray, so the more people you have in the house the more chances you have of bringing lots of different bugs into the house. So all the people that were going out during the day, all the interactions they'll be having, all the people they'll be coming across, all the surfaces they'll be touching, all the air they'll be breathing, they'll be bringing that into the same house from lots of more different sources into that smaller source. And that is obviously a very difficult impact for particularly our grandparents. Um, those that are younger and fitter, yes, they can still get the virus, but so far it looks like that they get the virus less severely and it's like a seasonal flu. But for those people that are of a certain age and who have certain preconditions, it can be fatal. It can be fatal. Viral kindness. The reason um, I asked you to comment is if you could shed some light on this, explain me and viewers out there yeah. what viral kindness is all about, what you have in plan, what's in place at the moment, what you're yeah. doing. So, so basically, goes about but uh, at a time of crisis, you will have people that are showing humanity and kindness right around the country. So right across the country, there are hundreds of people, either as individuals, as community groups, as faith groups, as charities, as businesses, that are all f offering to help and to volunteer. And at the same time, right across the country, there'll be thousands of people that are feeling vulnerable, feeling alone, feeling isolated. And if you can imagine, for those people that don't have a support base or a support mechanism, or those that are in complete lockdown themselves, um, not having access to simple food, to medicines, could be life or death for those people and those families. So what we wanted to do across the country was create a platform, a free to use platform, which is free to use by phone, free to use by post, free to use online, free to use on social media channels like Instagram, on uh, Twitter, on Facebook and other social media platforms where we can, in one place, be a connector service. So we want all those people that want to volunteer to register, all those people that are organising and creating those groups to register. And then if you are someone that needs help, register. And if you're someone that knows someone that needs help, register. And then what we do is we make the connections. So let me give you a practical example of what I mean by that. Just say, for example, on your own street, there is someone that uh, is agreed to volunteer. So take me, for example, say I've registered to volunteer and I'm saying I'm willing to go and collect and drop off shopping. I'm willing to go and find emergency supplies or I'm willing to pick up the phone and talk to someone once a day to make sure they're doing okay. Or I'm willing to go and get a piece of mail that is urgent post and I can go and post it for someone. And at the same time, someone phones from that same very street or same very area saying they need help with one of those things. What we do as a platform, we will connect the two people together. So we will connect the person that needs the help with the person that is offering the help. So you have I'll a call centre in place? Yes, yeah, so we have a free phone call centre uh, in place. Um, I'll get you the number in just a second. I don't yeah. know off by heart. Um, if you go to viralkindness.scot, so yeah, the website. I think website, we've got the number, if I can tell Swan to put that on the screen. Viral Scotland, we've got the number. Viralkindness.scot, yep. So then the, the online post is viralkindness.scot. If you go on Twitter, it's at viralkindscot. And on Facebook, it's forward slash Viral Kindness Scotland. I was so, speaking to, just before you, yeah, Ram Malik from Strawberry Gardens, and I was speaking to Saka Bamath via phone. There's a lot of Asian, a lot of Pakistani people 
elderly in their houses. So I was saying to <coughs> Imran that there should be something in place if somebody needs yep. food or it needs this does that. So this does so that. So he was saying to me that he has nothing in place. And I right. just suggested that I would get Councillor Sakab to speak to yep. Viral Scotland, Viral Kindness, yep. and maybe get somebody. Yep. So, what we want, so what we want to do is anybody, doesn't matter where they are in Scotland, if they, have a, if they as an individual or a business wants to help or a group wants to help, register. And at the same time, we have 250,000 cards going out right across the country okay. to, so people can fill it in and say they need help and send it back. And we will make the connections. So we already have five, over 500 small businesses and organizations signed up. So we know where they are. We know the geography that they are. We have hundreds of volunteers signing up uh, as well. And then we want, we've got lots of people who are obviously needing help at the same time. We want to make those connections. So to people like Imran at Strawberry Garden, to local councillors that will know the local area well, this is not about replacing your organisation. This is not about telling you how to run your organisation. This is purely about ensuring that all those people that have offered help can then be matched with people matched who need with help. People. So it's, it's a, a connector it's service. service. That's very good. Right, um, and as Scottish government, are, are they or were they prepared for this? So there's a few, there's a few things going by. So we can have a debate, I think, after this is all over about how well prepared we were or not. Uh, currently, yeah, for the next so, two weeks. So I, I think we're making preparations, but I think there's still a lot of work to, 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 to do. Be done. So I'll, I'll give you some practical examples for that. Is if you look at the World Health Organization advice, their advice is test, 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 test. Okay. Exactly what you said, yeah. word for word, test, 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 test. We do not have an adequate testing regime in place at the moment. Now that's partly because we don't have enough testing kits and we also don't have adequate capacity at the moment to do those tests and then be able to go and find the results. So we need to build that testing capacity, that's one part. A second part is the NHS workforce itself needs to have adequate equipment and safety procedures. That's not yet 100% in place. The government is moving quickly to try and make that happen, but part of that is getting the adequate supplies of masks, of gloves, of protective wear, PPP equipment, PPE equipment, etc. So that, that's one part. There's then another part which is about you're going to have over the course of the next few weeks a, a number of medical professionals who are working on the front line who will, ha will get sick themselves. Yeah. So how do we supplement that workforce so one of the things that I'll be asking the government to do this week is all those opticians, all those dentists, all those uh, dental nurses, all those people that work in and around the National Health Service but don't work in hospitals, how do we, who are, who are now pretty vacant in terms of their work because there's no people, very few people going into the dental practice, very few people going into the optician, is how do we use that workforce and bring them into the National Health Service so we can help them uh, with that. There's also other other issues, and I, I may as well bring them up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Away because they're they're um, they're obviously hot topics at the moment. There's a hot topic around food supply. Yeah. My my plea to everybody is there is enough food to go around to feed everybody, but only if we are fair. So let's not hoard all the food. Let's be sensible about how we shop. Let's be sensible about where we shop, and therefore be able to make sure everyone can feed themselves, their families, and get adequate supplies. So at the moment, people are posting lots of photographs of empty shelves in supermarkets. Yeah. There are lots of shops with lots of uh, lots. product. Use your local shops as well as using uh, your supermarkets. Alongside that, people are making issues around the prices of products going up, particularly in fruit and veg and in meat shop. Um, I've been discussing that directly with uh, meat shop owners and also with fruit and veg owners. And look, they understand that their community has been loyal to them, they need to be loyal to their community as well if they want their business to, to function. Now, some of it, I'm not going to pretend, there'll be some people that want to take advantage of a bad situation, but they do have some genuine concerns around the cost of the supply chain. And I've been shown receipts, for example, where something that they were being charged £50 for last week, the supplier is now charging them £105 this week, for example, some of the abattoirs, etc. So a lot of work needs to be done to try and manage the supply chain to make sure we can keep the price down, particularly when people are struggling, so people are still able to buy food and supplies. And then another issue that's obviously very live at the moment is the issue of the emergency legislation. So I don't know if you've come across this yet, Goshibai. If you haven't, I'm sure it'll be um, live amongst people over the next few days. Is currently the government is producing emergency legislation so we can deal with the coronavirus outbreak. And one of the clauses in that emergency legislation 
is to give local authorities, so Glasgow City Council, for example, or East Renfrewshire Council, or South Lanarkshire or North Lanarkshire Council, is to give the local authorities the power to do forced cremations of okay. people that pass away. So there's obviously a lot of concern, particularly among Muslim and Jewish communities, yeah. around what happens when people, someone passes away, how the janazah will, will take place and how they will be buried. And there's a job of work to be done between parliamentarians about how we can make sure we safeguard those communities in the legislation. Just to be very clear about it though, they're not suggesting forced cremations for everybody. What they're talking about is those situations where you have hundreds of deaths in one local authority, you run out of burial space or you run out of people to do the burials, what happens in those situations? And in those situations, they are saying the local authority should have the power to say cremations take place rather than burials. Now that's obviously not acceptable for us yeah. in terms of from a religious perspective, neither is it acceptable for other religions. So we are working hard lobbying the government to make sure that we have provisions in place to give opt out for religious communities. Uh, and ask how many beds in Scotland do we have per 100,000? I don't know the exact number, but the reality is we have not enough beds. Do you think the army will come out, substitute I think other places? The, 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 the problem you have, Gushiba, is I think that when I looked at the figures last week, we only had, I think it was 58 to 68 free ICU beds in the whole of Scotland. Scotland. That's nowhere near enough so for the So there'll be temporary hospitals set up? So I, so what, what I think will happen, um, and obviously the government is working these issues through and we are um, engaging proactively with the, the government, is I think what will happen is those people that can be treated out with hospital, I'm not talking about coronavirus patients, I'm talking about other General. patients, I think they will try and get as many of those patients being treated at home um, rather than treated in a hospital. They will then try to treat the vast, vast, vast majority of coronavirus cases at home because for the vast majority of people, it will be, um, it will be like a normal flu, maybe a slightly more severe flu, but a normal flu. I think the stats I saw were 30% of people may get no symptoms at all. About 50% of people will get flu-like symptoms. And then for a 20% of the population, it's more severe than a flu and it is potentially life-threatening. For those 20%, they will need to strike the balance about who's treated from home and who's need to be treated in a hospital. Um, is there a chance that they might create more emergency units? I think there is. And I think what they're looking at at the moment is turning the Golden Jubilee Hospital into a specialist hospital, particularly for coronavirus. Do you think the army <coughs> will come out? They can go to the logo, they can send messages that there is a lockdown, and they can send photographs that there is an army coming out. There is an army coming out. Martial law is coming out. There is not going to be martial law. We are not going to have army officials patrolling the streets. That's not what's being proposed here. All the photographs that people have seen have been fake photographs from uh, Red Cross trucks and army trucks and from other parts of the world and indeed from previous times. What I think the army will be asked to do is where they can proactively help to deliver care and, and the systems in the UK, they'll be asked to do it. Let me give you some practical examples of what I mean by that. If there is a struggle in the supply chain, so the, just say the supply chain of either medicines, equipment or food becomes tested because production falls, because logistical companies lose their staff, because companies shut down and there's, not, there's a difficulty to get free movement of that equipment, those supplies and that food across the country. I think they'll ask the then, army to come in and help move that food around. Just say there's a sickness in the police, the police lose workforce, I think they'll be asked to come in and supplement the workforce. For those people that have a health background, that work in the army, that care for fellow soldiers, I think they'll be asked to be drafted to come in and help and support in the National Health Service. Some of the local authorities and local government and national government institutions that will lose their workforce because people are going off sick, they'll be asked to come in and supplement that work. So that's where I think the army will come in. Are we on the verge of uh, martial law? No, we aren't. So people don't so need to be worried about that. Our mosques, our, commu our community centres <coughs> in Scotland, are they getting um, utilised? Are they getting like approached to by yourself or, or authorities if we come to a point or if it gets to a stage that we, we need to use the masjid halls or the community centres? So, so, the, so the moment I don't think that's being looked at because obviously we don't want to make these community halls or faith groups, you know, coronavirus centres. I don't think that would be uh, appropriate. 
Um, but what I think the mosques and the churches and the gurdwaras and the mandars and the synagogues <coughs> should be looking at is you can't do congregations because of this. But there are lots of other ways that we can demonstrate our faith and our humanity. Uh, one of that is volunteering, one of that is looking out for those less fortunate. So how do we get the masjid thinking about those kind of things? How do we get the masjid to think about who are those uncles, aunties, those elderly people that use the services of the masjid who will now feel isolated? How do we identify them to make sure they're getting the support they need? I think that's going to be really important. So how do you turn that into community initiatives rather than uh, into congregation <laughs> settings is one important part. But there's also one sensitive part that I think we as a community need to have a lot more engagement with and that is what do we do in terms of our janazah protocol? Yes, that's a major question. So there is still a major question about what we do about our janazah protocol. So I'm working with healthcare staff about, about access to healthcare. I'm working with healthcare staff about the equipment they need. I'm working with local organizations around how they register to support. Uh, I'm working with businesses around how they can be protected. I heard you talking earlier on about mortgage payments. Um, I think there will be a mortgage holiday. I think there will be a rent holiday so people aren't evicted from their homes. I think that will, will happen um, from the Scottish government and the UK government. But we have a sensitive issue amongst our own community, which is around how we deal with janazas. Janazas, that's, the, and, that's and, the main, and, the main and that, question and that, today. And, that, been... and that's going to that's gonna need some work because we need to get an understanding <laughs> for what the capacity the masjid is able to deal with. We also need to get an understanding for the masjid about what equipment they would need if they were to try and do ghusls, for example. We need to get an understanding from the NHS about what bodies they're willing to release and in what way because obviously the bodies will be wrapped a certain way if yeah. they are coronavirus patients. So what will they allow? What will they not allow? How will they ensure proper washing of the bodies? So when, how long and do then, you think, and then long also do you with think the local, And then also with the local authorities, we need to discuss with them about access to burial space, etc. I was speaking to Raya Saab uh, earlier on that in England, I've heard in like Oldham, Manchester and Birmingham that they're already preparing graves just in case the council workers can't come. So the graves are dug out yep. and their community halls will be used for... Uh, multiple janazas, right? So they're they're working on it, but I don't think we've not we've not seen or heard a statement from Glasgow C uh, Central Mosque. That's that's the that's the issue. So, I mean, so I mean, has a trustee in the mosque, so he'll he'll be better placed yes. to answer those so questions. He has explained that to they're me, ready, but I think people so need more. I, I more think I think I think people do need more satisfaction. Yeah. I, that's not to say they're not doing the work. They may no, well no, be doing the work. We're not, we're not saying um, that. But well, people, I, but, I, but, I, but I've I've made a promise to people that I will find out. Yeah. And once I find it, I'm happy to share that. Inshallah, Tala will do a show next week again just to give the public update if no we're all allowed to get back into the studio. Uh, otherwise, do it all by Skype. We'll all do it by <coughs> Skype. Thank you very much. Uh, and as for coming to the studios, Thank and Inshallah, Tala, I'll my love, see you. My love to all your family and to everyone watching. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Kai.